Hi, this is Andre from New Covenant Grace, and in this teaching we're going to be talking about what I believe to be one of the core principles of the entire Christian faith, and that is understanding how we can be 100% fully righteous, and why God also sees us as fully righteous, especially if we don't always feel righteous. Now, I went around for nearly two and a half decades of my life, trying to impress God and trying to please Him on the basis of how well I'm able to perform and my own level of obedience. Yet despite my best efforts, I could never shake that underlying sense of guilt and the lingering feeling of doubt about whether I was really saved. Now before we start, I always give credit where it's due, and Andrew Womack's teaching on spirit, soul and body was a great inspiration for this one. One of the main reasons why so many Christians have such a hard time understanding how God can see us as completely righteous despite our mistakes is the fact that they don't understand the principle of spirit, soul and body. The Bible clearly says we have all three. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 in the New King James Version says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are a spirit, we have a soul and we live in a body. This is very contrary to the worldly belief that we only have a body and a mind. Now remember that the mind is the same as the soul or the personality or the will or the intellect of a person. Worldly psychology completely disregards the existence of the spiritual realm. In this teaching we will outline what happened to each of these three parts when we became born again. Firstly, we look at the spirit. When we became born again, our spirit became alive to God. Previously our spirit was in a dormant, dead state towards God, but alive to sin. We were actually in sin. Ephesians 2 verse 5 puts it as follows. Even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. But then we put our faith in Christ Jesus, and this old sinful nature was crucified and buried with Christ. The Bible calls this old sinful nature the old man. Romans 6 verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Our old sinful nature was completely cut out of us, with a spiritual circumcision not done with human hands, as Colossians 2.11 in the Good News Bible puts it. In union with Christ you were circumcised, not with a circumcision that is made by human beings, but with a circumcision made by Christ, which consists of being freed from the power of the sinful self. Romans 2.29 says, Rather the real Jew, and in this context it's referring to being God's people, Rather, the real Jew is the person who is a Jew on the inside, that is, whose heart has been circumcised, and this is the work of God's Spirit, not of the written law. Colossians 3 verse 3 says, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now this last verse says, You died. And through the process of elimination, we should easily be able to figure out which part of us it's talking about. Simply ask yourself, Did my body die? The answer of course is no, because you are still very much alive, listening to my voice. Did my soul die? Well again, the answer is of course no. At this very moment you are processing the thoughts of what you are listening to with your mind, also called your soul or your intellect. So since neither the body nor the soul has died, this of course leaves us with the spirit. This verse is talking about the old sinful spirit man. The moment we become born again, our spirit becomes alive to God. Romans 6 verse 8 to 11 says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. A very important issue to raise at this stage is Paul the Apostle's use of the word sin. Now if my memory serves me correctly, only two or three times in the entire book of Romans is the word sin 
used as a verb. The other 42 or 43 times that Paul uses the word sin, it is used as a noun, which means that Paul was not referring to acts of sin, but instead to the inherent sinful nature that a person is born with. In the last passage of scripture that we read together, Romans 6, Paul said in verse 10 to 11, For the death that Christ died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now verse 11 starts with likewise, which means that it's referring to what he was saying in verse 10. The word reckon also actually means to consider. So in my own words, this is what I believe verse 10 to 11 is actually saying. Jesus died once on behalf of the whole of mankind, but now he is eternally alive to God. In the same manner as Christ, consider yourself also to be dead to sin, because just like Christ you are dead to sin, and just like Christ is now alive to God, consider yourself also to be alive to God. And here's the most amazing part. At the moment of salvation, our born-again spirit is created just as righteous as Jesus himself, perfectly holy and glorious, and has the very nature of Christ. The Father made Jesus to be sin in our place so that we could become His righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is often described by people as the great exchange and it says the following, For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Note that it doesn't say that God gave Him our sin, it said that He made Him sin. It also doesn't say that we just received righteousness. It says we became the righteousness of God in Him. Our born again spirit is sometimes also called the new man or the inward man. The last part of Ephesians 4 talks about our behavior towards other people and verse 24 says that just as our inner man has already been created according to the very image of Jesus, we should now also let our actions reflect this change that has occurred inside us. Ephesians 4.24 says, And that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3 verse 10 basically says the same, And have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This born again spirit man inside us can never change. It's made righteous forever. It's actually fused together with the Holy Spirit Himself. 1 Corinthians 6.17 in the New King James Version says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with Him. At this very moment, our born-again spirit is just as holy as it will be after spending 10,000 years in heaven. There's nothing that can be added to it. The last part of 1 John 4 verse 17 says, That as He is so are we in this world and it's talking about Jesus Christ at this moment Jesus is holy perfect righteous has authority over all things is seated at the right hand of God and this verse says that as he is so are we in this world not so we will be one day in heaven it says as he is so are we in this world it ought to be clear by now that all these verses are not referring to our conduct because if we have to look at our behavior every day, it would tell us a completely different story. None of us have arrived yet and none of us walk in 100% love every day. Yet in spite of our fluctuating levels of obedience, our born again spirit remains sealed 100% holy on the inside. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, in whom also you, hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also believing, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It isn't possible for a believer to corrupt the Holy Spirit inside of them, no matter how bad their behavior. If it were possible, it would mean that our sins is more powerful than the Holy Spirit. Once inside a Christian, it's also impossible for the Holy Spirit to leave, no matter how badly we mess up. In Matthew 28 verse 20, Jesus promised that He would be with us all the days until the end of the world. 
Now buckle up your seatbelt because most people are shocked when I share the following with them. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul reprimands the church in Corinth for doing stuff that is not even heard of among the Gentiles, such as a man that sleeps with his father's wife, in other words his mother. Then in 1 Corinthians 6 from verse 15 onwards, he reprimands them again for sleeping with the temple prostitutes. Now remember, these weren't Gentiles, they were born again spirit-filled believers. During all this, not once does Paul the Apostle tell them that the Holy Spirit will leave them or lift off them during these acts of foolishness. During all these things, Paul's message comes down to this. Do you really believe that the Holy Spirit enjoys it while you force Him to be a witness when you are doing these foolish things? Your body is His temple. He actually lives inside of you and He remains inside you while you do these things. Do you think the Holy Spirit enjoys it when you make His temple part of a temple prostitute? Again, not once do we see Paul mention that the Holy Spirit would leave them while they do this. Such is the grace and the power of God to sustain His children. As 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 mentions, we are like jars of clay in which this treasure is stored. It's the treasure that makes the jar holy and not the jar itself. Now it's time to take a look at what happens to the soul of a Christian when they become born again. Now the soul is the realm of the psyche and includes the mind, the personality, the will, the intellect and the emotions of a person. This part does not instantly change when we become born again. Yes, we've now made a choice for Christ to follow Him and serve Him, but this part of us still has the old thought patterns and habits of our BC or before Christ days. These thought patterns and habits were formed mainly during the period when we were still controlled by our old sinful nature and we simply ran around like animals obeying its lusts. We were slaves to the evil nature inside of us. And now, even though everything is new on the inside, we still find that our actions do not line up with the truth that our spirits have been created in righteousness and true holiness in the image of Christ. For most Christians, initially, it's as though there is a massive war raging on the inside of them. Their unrenewed mind, which the Bible calls the flesh, wages a war against their born-again spirit. Galatians 5.17 puts it into perspective for us. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you cannot do the things that you want. Verse 18 then goes on and says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Before a person is born again, the impossible holy standards of the law serves to expose the unbeliever's inability to attain righteousness through their own acts of obedience. Giving the law to an unbeliever is like adding fuel to a fire. It is supposed to bring them to the end of themselves when they see how badly they measure up against the law's righteous requirements. In the end, they have no choice but to look unto Jesus for their salvation. So again, Galatians 5 verse 18 says that if we are led by the Spirit, we are not under the law. This simply means that when a person is born again and they step into relationship with God, they have the Holy Spirit inside of them to lead them into all truth, and they do not need an external set of rules to tell them how to live anymore. I always compare it in terms of my relationship with my earthly dad. I don't need a book or a set of rules to tell me what to do to make him happy anymore. I know his heart and I know what to do to please him and to make him happy. But to get back to the point about our soul or our mind. When we become born again there is a battle that rages between our born again spirit and our unrenewed mind. The mind or the soul has to be trained to align with what happened in our spirit when we became born again. Previously. There was a control room on the inside of us, namely the old sinful nature, which barked out orders, and we had no choice but to comply because we were slaves to sin. Then that old control room was removed. It was cut out from us with a circumcision not made with hands, as Colossians 2 verse 11 says. A new control room was given to take its place, namely the born again spirit, created perfect and holy in the image of Jesus Christ. The nature and the desires of this new control room is very different than the old one, but the mind is still programmed to function according to the old way, and this is why it feels as though there is a battle raging on the inside of us sometimes. 
The mind needs to be trained in the ways of the new control room, which is exactly what Romans 12 verse 2 is talking about. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is that good and pleasing and perfect will of God. Mind renewal is a side effect of having a relationship with Jesus. When we spend time with Jesus, when we pray, read Bible, listen to New Covenant or Grace sermons like you're doing right now, when we fellowship with like-minded believers or let the Holy Spirit bear His fruit through us, our minds will effortlessly begin to change. This list of stuff that I just mentioned is not a recipe or a list of have-tos. The need to study the Word or to pray or do any of these other things will manifest itself as a desire in us which is simply the mighty Holy Spirit expressing His desire to lead us into all truth. This is true sanctification and not the sin management program that so many Christians have turned their lives into. Unfortunately, the majority of Christians in the world today have reduced their entire Christian walk to nothing more than a process by which they try and reduce the frequency of sin and increase the number of good things that they do every day. This is a far cry from the dynamic, vibrant and intimate love relationship that God desires to have with His bride. Sanctification is falling in love with Jesus and learning to get to know Him better. When we run to Jesus, we will automatically run away from sin. Okay, so let's take a look at the last part of the three, namely the body. Just like the soul, the body remains unchanged at the point of salvation. If somebody battled with a disease or an ailment before they got saved, then normally after they were born again, they would find that this thing is still in their body. Sometimes though, they are healed at the same time but I have not found this to be very common. So at salvation, the believer's spirit becomes alive towards God and their body the carrier or the temple for the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, You surely know that your body is a temple where the Holy Spirit lives. The Spirit is in you and is a gift from God. You are no longer your own. In the Old Testament, God lived in man-made buildings. Remember when Moses and Israel erected the tabernacle, or when Solomon built the temple? Both times God's presence came like a cloud and filled the building. Well, in the New Testament we are the temple. Our bodies are the divine carriers of God's abiding presence. We are the church. That's why I sometimes find it so funny that people say on Sunday mornings they go to church. Well, how can you go to church if you are the church? Yes, we may be getting together with lots of other fellow believers in a big building, but that building is definitely not the church. That is simply the building where the believers or the church gets together. We are the church. The body of a believer will either follow the desires of their born-again spirit or of their unrenewed mind. If we give our mind control and our mind has not been renewed yet, we are walking according to the flesh and the fruit of this is death death in the form of us reaping the results of our ungodly actions. Romans 6 verse 21 says, What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Galatians 6 verse 8 also says, For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now contrary to popular belief, this verse doesn't talk about reaping punishment for sin. It talks about reaping earthly or fleshly consequences for fleshly actions or decisions. Someone who for example steals and gets caught by the local justice system might end up in jail. Somebody that makes a habit of sleeping around could possibly contract sexually transmitted diseases or emotional baggage or broken relationships. Somebody that smokes puts themselves in danger of contracting lung cancer. These are just a few examples. Now I'm not saying that these things will happen, I'm saying they may happen as a result of our actions. All these things are not judgments or punishments from God, since God is not in that business anymore. I guess the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. After we have been born again and perfected in the Spirit, 
Do we really still want to occupy ourselves with this garbage? Galatians 5 verse 16 to 18 says, If you are guided by the Spirit, you won't obey your selfish desires. The Spirit and your desires are enemies of each other. They are always fighting each other and keeping you from doing what you feel you should. But if you obey the Spirit, the law of Moses has no control over you. And that's from the contemporary English version. So the law appeals to our flesh in that it gives us a standard to measure ourselves against you. But there is now a better way to live, namely to be led by the Spirit. As we actively pursue having our minds renewed, the desires of our born-again spirit will start filtering down into our mind. And since the body follows the commands of the mind, our actions will portray whether our minds are still filled with the desires of our old, dead, sinful nature, or whether our minds are renewed to the truth of God's word. But now, since we've been made alive in the spirit and died to sin, let us also walk according to the spirit. If our old sinful nature has been crucified with Christ, why would we still want to live according to it? That would be silly, wouldn't it? As our mind becomes more and more renewed, our body, which follows the commands of our mind, will also walk more and more in line with what's already happened in our spirit, lining up more and more to the righteous purposes of God. Romans 6 verse 19 says, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. To conclude, remember that a believer is a spirit, they have a soul and live in a body. Their spirit is completely righteous and holy, and since the believer is a spirit, the actual person has been made the righteousness of God. It's now simply a matter of getting our mind and body to line up with this truth. Well, I hope this message has blessed you. Understanding the principle of spirit, soul and body has been fundamental in my life to understanding why God still sees me as completely righteous, even though I mess up from time to time. I pray that this would become an unfolding, increasing revelation for you as well, that you would be firmly established in God's unwavering love and that you would know that you know that you know that He loves you regardless of your worst behavior.